the sunset spectacular of the commonest and the most successful wild bird in the world, the starling. Busy, pushing, talkative, quarrelsome, adaptable. The secret of the starling's success is his opportunism. Some of the opportunities he takes don't exactly endear him to us, but nevertheless, his life cycle makes a fascinating story. Not a large bird, the starling's blackish plumage is spotted with white and attractively shot with iridescent metallic colors. Today, the starling is one of the most familiar of the 200 kinds of British nesting birds. But two centuries ago, it was rare. Then, it was not an urban bird at all. It was nesting only in a variety of natural sites, like the crevices in the rugged red sea bastions of the north. In treeless areas like the Orkney Islands, the starling was nesting on the ground in rabbit burrows. Cracks in rotten trees would then have been the most profitable places to look for starling nests. A few took over old woodpecker holes, or even new woodpecker holes, ousting the occupants. In sand martin colonies too, martins having dug out a nesting tunnel had to suffer starlings as squatters. Natural sites are still of course used, but soon the opportunist learnt to move in on man. Nowadays, in mid-20th century, swift advantage is taken of almost any site unwittingly provided by us. Without deserting the countryside, the starling has invaded the villages, towns and cities. Of the 10 million pairs in Britain today, more than half must now nest in a man-made site of one kind or another. Just how long-standing the construction has been doesn't seem to matter. The story of the private life of a pair of starlings can best start in late March. The male's first task is to find a suitable site in which he can build a nest. Only when he has done this can he then go in search of a mate. An old woodpecker hole is carefully inspected from the outside and then tried for size and shape before being decided upon. Unlike many birds, the male starling will not now defend a large tract of land round the nest only the immediate area of the nest site itself. And ownership of this, he proclaims by loud song and much wing waving. Early in April, the cock forges ahead busily. The local females are still quite uninvolved. A nest of only average size will involve thousands of separate pieces of material and hundreds of visits by the cock. When he completes his work on the nest in a couple of days' time, he will then start to lure a hen towards it by using his special nest advertisement call. The male urges, chases or drives almost any potential mate to inspect the hole and the newly completed nest. Eventually, one female accepts both nest and nest builder. The birds become a pair 
and soon they'll mate for the first time. The first sky blue egg is laid next morning. The eggs of many hole nesting birds are light in colour so that the adults can see them more easily. Three mornings later, the clutch of four eggs is complete and incubation can begin. By day, the adults take it in turns to sit. But by night, it's always the female who covers the eggs. During his off-duty periods, the cock continues to sing. A lively, rambling medley of throaty, warbling, chirruping, clicking and gurgling notes interspersed with musical whistles. But more than this, the starling is a mimic, a one-man band, the voice of them all. For a reason no scientist can discover, the starling incorporates into his song the voices of other birds. Listen to this one very carefully. He's mimicking the nearby farmyard hens. Now, bubbling song from a real curlew. Starling copying curlew. A lapwing giving its pee-wit cry. And the starling attempts to take off the lapwing. Starlings can also give impressions of trains, babies, telephone bells and all sorts. From Ireland it's reported that a starling copied a referee's whistle so faithfully that a football match had to be abandoned. On about the 1st of May, after 12 days as eggs, the youngsters hatch out and so starts a very busy three weeks for their parents, collecting food. But busy though they'll be, the problem would have been worse at any other season because the nesting is so timed that the young hatch when the maximum food is available. This is why starlings nest when they do. The parents collect up to 1,200 sizeable insects or larvae every day. Many of the creatures brought are known to be harmful to agriculture, wireworms and leather jackets. It's tempting to conclude that the starling must be a useful bird. In Scotland, a scientist found that starlings brought up their broods almost entirely on leather jackets, each pair of birds collecting 5,000 leather jackets in three weeks. But what the scientist also discovered was that the birds were catching only one in 20 of all the local leather jackets, leaving 95% of them behind. So it looks as if the starlings' activities are of little value to the farmer. However, Early European settlers in other parts of the world were convinced they could farm better if they took starlings to help them. To New Zealand, starlings were first introduced in 1862. They spread rapidly and even colonised part of Antarctica. In Australia, 36 birds were released in 1863. Today there are millions covering the southeast and Tasmania. Given a foothold in South Africa, by the turn of the century, these hardy British immigrants soon took over most of the Cape. The most remarkable spread of all was in North America. An eccentric who thought that all the birds in Shakespeare should be allowed to live wild in the United States released 80 starlings in New York in 1890. Three quarters of a century later, they've conquered a continent. 500 million starlings, coast to coast. Originally found only in Europe and in a tiny part of Asia, today the Starling's empire extends to six continents. It must surely be the commonest and the most successful wild bird in the world.
and in many of these places, with each successive brood about to fledge, the numbers are still increasing. Once out of the nest, the birds will be fed by their parents for a few days, but then they're on their own, fending for themselves. In June, while their parents are embarking on second families, the young starlings forage mainly on agricultural land. They often trail along behind cattle, which flush insect prey that they can then catch. A favourite ploy in July is scrumping. Various kinds of fruit are attacked, though it's as cherry thieves that starlings really excel. In trying out different types of food, there comes a time when the young starling meets for the first time the wood ant on its anthill. Wood ant workers are particularly active from early August onwards. They must look quite appetising to young starlings who are still testing the edibility of anything and everything. But pick up a wood ant and it squirts its natural acid in your face, formic acid. Not very pleasant, you'd think, but amazingly, the starlings don't retreat. Instead, they instinctively pick up more and more ants and using them as a sort of living feather spray, apply the acid to their feathers. These birds are literally anointing themselves with insecticide, this frenzied anting behaviour being to rid the plumage of feather lice. But anting is only one aspect of feather care. Starlings also oil their plumage and they bathe in water. The front of the body is lowered into the water while the bird dips its head in and shakes its bill from side to side, all the while flicking its wings. His aim is to wet the plumage evenly, but to avoid soaking it, he constantly ruffles his feathers. These home-bred starlings will remain in Britain throughout the winter. From the continent, each autumn, vast hordes of foreign immigrant starlings come here, from Russia, Finland, Sweden, the Baltic States and Germany. Straggling black battalions pour across, skimming the waves to reduce wind resistance. They troop by with uncanny steadiness, of course, by day and by night. Navigating by the sun or by the stars presents no difficulty to them, provided there's no fog. But if they're caught in the North Sea on a really misty night, they congregate on lightships like the Smith's Knoll, 25 miles off the coast of Norfolk. Huddled together to conserve what energy they have left, the birds will sit it out until the fog lifts or dawn breaks. On nights when the stars are blotted out for hours on end, several thousand starlings may pile up on a single ship. Of one of the biggest known visitations, an eyewitness wrote, the rigging, masts, decks, in fact, all available perching places were covered with resting birds. Birds were so numerous that as I stepped on deck from below, my head and shoulders were covered with birds seeking new resting places. Thousands more circled the lantern, and many hit the lantern glass, resulting in a terrific mortality. At times, stunned and dead birds dropped into the sea and onto the deck continuously. Many hundreds, probably thousands, must have been lost that night. Those were the words of ornithologist Dennis Owen, who lived on a North Sea lightship in the autumn of 1952. This victim was ringed as a nestling in Vormland, south-central Sweden, in June.
Alive but waterlogged, a hapless starling soon falls victim to a marauding gull. So hungry are the survivors, they will try almost anything, even pecking at a dead bird of their own kind. Of course, they don't think of it as a dead starling, it's merely food to them. On the whole, it's the less hardy starlings that die. The fitter ones survive and are helped to make an eventual landfall by the lightsmen who provide food and water. The best known winter roosts of starlings are in towns. Glasgow can boast the biggest urban assemblage, at least a quarter of a million birds. Many of the starlings assemble on the old buildings in the centre of the city, buildings which have come to earn the title Whited Sepulchres. The black blizzards that come sweeping into the city ledges have caused considerable public concern. Buildings and pavements are badly fouled. There's been constant agitation from property owners, complaints from the public, even questions in the House of Commons. The Ministry of Works and various local authorities have fought a 30 years war against the cheeky chappy of the bird world. They are still campaigning. The weapons have included stuffed owls, rubber snakes, supersonic sirens and fireworks, but none of these has proved effective. A double electric fence laid along the ledges will deter the birds, but it's very expensive. Nets will keep the birds off, but they're unsightly. Another deterrent is to apply to ledges a product called scarecrow strip. Plastic gel is laid as a continuous ribbon. Alighting birds feel a sense of insecurity and fly away. Some, who wistfully admit that it does work, describe it as a very successful method of shifting birds onto the buildings opposite. In London, a hundred thousand commuting starlings change places each morning and evening with hundreds of thousands of human commuters. The familiar underground map of the London Transport Board has been matched for the London Natural History Society, who've plotted a similar piece of cartography to show the routes taken by starlings each day. Some of these fly lines bring birds from daytime feeding grounds as far distant as 14 miles from the West End. Why do they come? It's warmer. The centre of the city is a few degrees up on the surrounding countryside, enough to make the starlings feel a little more comfortable. But just how they feel about swinging London, we've no means of knowing. On one classic occasion, so many starlings perched on the minute hand of Big Ben that they prevented it from striking nine o'clock. To witness the assembly of starlings at a country roost is the most impressive sight a British bird watcher could offer to any visitor. A really large roost will draw in birds from a vast area, often 30 miles across. The build-up is slow at first, birds pausing in the last rays of the sun to snatch a few final morsels of food to help see them through the night. In midwinter, when daylight hours are at a minimum, starlings have to forage until it's literally too dark for them to see their insect prey. As the sun slowly sinks, the birds will rise and come hurrying in for the final assembly. The stage is set. The sunset spectacular is about to begin, 
and there can be up to three million performers. Suddenly, the assembled company rises together to engage in the most impressive aerial manoeuvres and excited community singing. The great multitude changes shape and direction like a giant amoeba silhouetted against the sky. On the grand scale, these evolutions are one of the great marvels of animal adaptation. So perfect is the bird's coordination, so intense is the urge to excel in their performance. Why exactly the birds should indulge in these mass exhibitions, no scientist really knows. It can't be safety in numbers, for roosts regularly attract birds of prey like sparrowhawks. One recent suggestion is that the birds are in effect holding a nightly conference about the local supply of food, and that if food is running out, a percentage of the birds must next day move on. After the show has gone on for 30 minutes or so, the last bird settles on its perch. To track starlings when they leave their roosts each morning, the modern ornithologist uses radar. At the Marconi radar station on the top of Bushy Hill in Essex, a speeded up film of the morning departures will show ring angels, as the radar men call them. The circling ripples are really starlings dispersing from their roosts all over southeast England. Another morning, a closer view, as millions of starlings start their day, radiating out over the countryside from their night quarters. A March morning, and not radiating ripples, but an eastward surge. The continental cousins are returning home to nest. Although they may have set out in large flocks, high winds over the North Sea have dispersed them into smaller, straggling parties. Despite the weather, flocks won't come aboard all the time the sun's position is clear enough for the birds to navigate by. To push on means a better chance of survival. The occasional individuals that do come aboard must already be so weak that they're not going to make it anyway. But enough starlings will get through to repopulate Scandinavia, Central Europe and the Soviet Union. Back home, our own bird in his quiet tract of woodland takes up his post to set the yearly cycle in motion again. Nuisance though it may sometimes be, it's difficult not to admire this bird for his toughness and adaptability mimicry and showmanship, and sheer force of personality, the starling. <laughs> 